Yeah, because bookmobile is one word. It's a that was a line of dialogue from a movie I edited back in '93 that I've never forgot. It's oh. you know uh, Ed Asner is a serial killer, and John Cryer and Ed Asner has a speech of of uh, uh, you know why 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 because there's a burning in my brain because bookmobile is one word. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, that's incredibly. Did you say 93 you edited that? You yeah, still got a yeah. Oh, dialogue. there's so much yeah. dialogue for that movie. It's a little uh, decapitation comedy called Heads with John Cryer, Jennifer Tilly, Ed Asner, and Roddy McDowell. Oh, and wow. I, Roddy. And I, it, and I can remember, Roddy had this great line is, uh, you know, one man's death is another man's booty. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Why, why, dear boy, I do believe you're shaking. Um, <laughs> now. Yeah. Roderick, get this boy an ice chamomile. <laughs> Jesus. This is a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, a, is this, it's a great... Is it this film movie. specifically, or if you, if you start going through all the films that you've edited, can oh, you be like, oh, yeah, no, this film, fuck, this I can remember. <laughs> because when you edit, you so much of the dialogue gets locked in your brain. Yep. And it's um, just there forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's face it, she's no Sharon, she's, she's no Sharon Stone. Mm. But yeah, there's there's one <laughs> yeah, that uh, yeah. I think is locked in yeah. our brain forever and ever. Yeah, that's uh, that's so so cool. Uh, By definition alone, there are fewer films. Films, 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 films. Sequels suck. Sequels suck. Sequels suck. Films. Yeah. Uh, hello, movie fans. Very excited to introduce another episode of Sequel Suck to you, a very special episode of Sequel Suck today. Uh, we had the, the the privilege, the honor, the joy, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the real good time uh, to sit down and have a conversation with uh, one of the, I don't know, one of the greats of the business, I would say, uh, who's been very near and dear to our hearts because they've been involved in one of the franchises that has been very near and dear to our hearts here at Sequel Suck, uh, Patrick Lucier joins us on the show today. We got to have a great conversation with him about his own career, about his experiences working with the late, great Wes Craven, his experiences working on the Scream franchise, which of course is, is a big part of how this show came to be. And, uh, and this is coming off the back of our Scream 2 episode. So we're really excited that we got a chance to sit down and talk with Patrick. And, and he was so generous with his time. He was so uh, affable. He was so easygoing. It was just a brilliant time. We loved it, uh, and I think you will too. So, um, no, no mucking about. Here's our interview with the excellent Patrick Lucio. And just give us a little bit of your backstory. And what was exciting? I didn't even know this. About, this is the one thing I'm embarrassed, and I'll, I'll put my hand up and admit I knew a lot about you, a lot of what you'd done, apart from MacGyver, which is a TV show that obviously was very big, <laughs> which was very, which was very big in the US, um, obviously, but it was actually very big here in Australia as well. So. Yeah. Um, you know, that was a Saturday night thing, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s, sit down with mum and dad and watch MacGyver and, and then realise that's where you sort of pretty much got your start in Hollywood is kind of crazy. It is indeed. Yeah. MacGyver and uh, yeah. Yeah. The Hitchhiker, uh, which was uh, as an assistant editor, which was, you know, HBO's one of their first shows, which was you know, Yuppies Run Amok. Yeah. Uh, and it was all about the gratuitous killing and, 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 and yuppie nudity. Uh, yeah. Back oh, in wow. 1986, it sounds like American Psycho, but the TV show. Um, like yeah, crazy. yeah, a little goofier. Oh, um, nice. Um, it was introduced by a guy who was called the Hitchhiker, who'd be out on the road thumbing and it had. Oh wow! Oh, <laughs> and he would he would intro an extra each episode, and he would sort of work his way in. And uh, Paige Fletcher is the Hitchhiker. I oh, believe was the credit. See, this is there's there are glaring omissions in Australian television over the years that we we lose out on some incredible shows because for the longest time we had five channels and that was it yeah. five and they just couldn't fit it in and so there's some great programs that we just well, never got and, and 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 Australian directors were on it. Philip Noyce did some, I think mm. Colin Buxy did some, and and I think Colin Buxy's Australian, but uh, there. Uh, Oh, Lang, I can't remember his first name. But anyway, there was a whole lot of different directors who came in and different different 
actors and stars and you know because it was an anthology show uh the year i did there was an episode uh that starred bud court and bill paxton right after oh, wow. bill paxton had been in aliens and uh as a couple of serial killers who who found each other called uh, made for each other wow and, wow all right well i got yeah. some serious uh searching and downloading to do to try and find yeah. this sounds like classic television so i think uh, something <laughs> something that's probably good to to highlight to to listeners because uh not everyone i think is going to have gone intense on research as cable as i did but you you so you're canadian correct that's correct yeah and uh I was reading some articles and something I found out like your transition to LA, your transition from television to film in large part revolves around Wes Craven. He actually Absolutely, sponsored you yeah. to move yeah, no, to he, the United States. He did indeed. Yeah. We, um, uh, I got to be, uh, I was cutting MacGyver, just finishing the, my third season of MacGyver, which was season six of MacGyver uh, in Vancouver uh, before they moved the last season of cutting down to Los Angeles. And uh, finished that and they were, kind of, Wes was directing people under the stairs at the time. So Philip Noyce was directing the pilot to Nightmare Cafe, which Wes and Tom Baum, Tom Baum wrote that made for each other episode with Phil Paxton and, and, uh, and Bud Court um uh they had uh, written it uh, based on an idea by wes's son jonathan craven and uh and and because they were bringing in richard francis bruce to edit an australian editor uh brilliant amazing editor you know shawshank redemption dead calm mad max beyond thunderdome uh, air force one you know, the list goes on and on um uh they they were bringing somebody else and they need to hire a match like for the union. So a match editor and, and that was me. And a lot of times they'll hire a match and you know, they'll pay you to stay home. Um, but Richard was like, Meh, I'll cut the first half, you cut the second half. And, and I, I learned more in the four weeks of cutting with Richard than, than I had the entire three years of editing on MacGyver. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And then coming back, in the fall to do five more episodes. Wes came in and he oversaw all of those. He directed one. I cut three of those, including the one that Wes directed. And uh, and he and I just hit it off. And he was like, I'd lo love you to direct my next feature. And he sponsored myself and my family to move to Los Angeles. Um, and that next feature was Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Although during that two years, it did look like it was gonna be uh, Village of the Damned for a while. That's right. Uh, before yeah, John Carpenter did it. Yeah. Because yeah. he was he was um, uh, he was originally going to do that. They developed that for quite some time and, and they were waiting on Linda Hamilton to either say yes or no. And if she had said yes, they would have made it. And because she had finally passed, um, they ended up uh, opting out of it. And John and his team came in and, and did a quite a different version than the one that Wes was going to make. Wow. And so the other thing that I noticed is sort of the parallels with you traveling in, in Wes's universe, something I've always read about Wes Craven, which I, I have seen with your career as it's sort of moved from the early days to now. It doesn't seem like you were going in to be genre people. It doesn't seem like you were starting out and like, yeah, we're going to go and do this. Like Wes always talked about how that was never the plan. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Was genre in your blood? Did you always want to get into horror? I, I, I always liked it. You know, it was, uh, I think I've told the story before, it, you know, it's very, it was very much the thing I wasn't allowed to, you know, I wasn't even allowed to go see like Land of Time Forgot with Doug McClure and remember dinosaurs. <laughs> no. uh, and that would give you nightmares. <laughs> um, and, and that's crazy. That's, that's actually something we've got in common in that I was reading it. I'll give a shout out to Ryan Hills. He did an interview with you a few months ago. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Um, that was something you talked about that your parents, uh, I guess you were sort of sheltered a bit and you weren't allowed to watch those films. And I had that same experience. My mum was very big on us not seeing any of that sort of stuff. So like you said, your sister was that sort of conduit where she'd she see was, the movie yeah. and she would tell you everything. And I felt like for me, even the, the my first memories of A Nightmare on Elm Street, I felt like I knew the movie without seeing it because the kids at school yeah. that were allowed to see it got to tell me about it. Or well, even Rambo, that was too violent. So I wasn't allowed to see that. So I knew all the beats of that movie before I ever saw it. 
because of somebody else. Yeah. Well, that, and and there was a there was a thing during the late. 70s late 70s called a photo novel they're a little hard to find now oh, wow. but they are somebody makes a photo novel comic of a movie yeah um uh, one of my favorite films is, is kaufman's invasion of the body snatchers yeah which i again i wasn't allowed to see um <laughs> although that was right near the end of that not allowed to see craze because i was starting to sort of figure out ways to see things yep. um but I knew that movie intimately because it was literally a, a and using stills, it wasn't a comic book, it was using stills from the movie. It was literally all, um, there's a great version, a big format version of that, of, of um, Alien, which I remember oh, wow. that was my first experience of Alien was reading wow. that. Uh, Nightwing, the, uh, the Nick Mancuso, uh, David Warner uh, vampire bat uh, epic based on a Martin Cruz Smith book, I uh, had one of those. I, I remember, uh, yeah. And then you, wow. uh, Nightwing might not hold up as much as the others, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it, when you can see all the photos and everything, and that probably led to a lot of my fascination of editing as well, because here's all these images, how the images go together and stuff like that. But yeah, it's called photo novels spelt with an F. Wow. That's cool. I'm, I'm gonna have to look yeah. on eBay for one of those. E e eBay fodder, I'm sure you'll. Find yeah, that's it. Yeah. You've just both both Cable and, and and my wives are both silently cursing you now because you oh, just sent yeah. an eBay yeah, my screen. My <laughs> just gonna. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah. Um, so you 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 circled sort of editing early on in your life. You did, was that something you looked at and said, "Yeah, I want to do that." Or do, again, yeah, just, once I once I sort of became aware aware of it and started doing it, something I really liked doing, you know, um, and I had a bit of a knack for in college, like, a, a, you know, I went to a, uh, a local community college because um, uh, the university wouldn't accept me in the, in the film program. Did you uh, do art house, is that right? You were like, I don't want to do art house because you didn't want to do art oh, house. Oh yeah, movies, well, they, right? they, and they were like, they were like part of, part of your entry thing is you had to have seen one of, one of the professor's movies and write about the professor's <laughs> movie. And, um, and, and the, I applied twice. The first time I wrote about the thing, the second time I wrote about Blade Runner or vice versa, I can't remember which order. And, and neither time I got in because I was told my, my aspirations were far too commercial. Um, oh, wow. Uh, and and that, that would never happen. Uh, of course, Vancouver shortly after that became and, and is you know, a major film town and, and Vancouver's now, I think they, they're running 60 to 70 productions at once. Um, so, you know, it's a major film center, but, but back when I was going to university or trying to, they were like, <laughs> um, and I remember seeing one of the, one of the professor's films and it had intercut all these game shows, old pornos, uh, uh, it seems from like the Holocaust and um, and a baby being born, but in reverse. Oh, wow. I was like, what the fuck is this? Um, I don't want to make any of that. Apparently uh, that's odd. Yeah, well, yeah. So um, I can even remember his name, but I won't say it. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a good a listen for anyone who's out there at the moment who's entering university. Uh, maybe don't listen to your professors. Maybe if they're telling well, you that movies like The Thing and Blade Runner aren't really yeah, worth yeah. investigating, yeah. watch them film a baby in reverse. Maybe you know, don't go to do that course. Yeah, well, it's uh, there's there's different ways for everybody. <laughs> so, Patrick, with Scream Two, you know, on the back of the success of the first movie, um, it was. You know, it was something that sort of was out of the box, like you and Wes and the people that were involved in Scream knew it was going to be a good movie, but probably not as big as it became worldwide. No. How much, even as you being an editor, how much pressure was, or did you feel any pressure on you to deliver on a second one? Uh, sure, I think everybody did. Um, but at the same time, there was a... Uh, I think a confidence uh, that the success of the first film gave you. Um, 
you know, I had been, uh, I left Scream when I finished editing that and immediately went on to edit Mimic, uh, the, the cockroach movie, Del Toro's cockroach movie. The, the great uh, and, cockroach movie. That's a fantastic film. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was a process. Uh, <laughs> that, that was a challenging film. And I think, you know, I think Guillermo, uh, for a long time, used to talk about his career as he'd measure it to how many movies he was finally away from that experience. I don't know if he still does, but, oh, wow. but it, it, it was a brutally, unnecessarily hard uh, experience, especially for him. And uh, leaving that to come onto screen too, everything was easier, yeah. um, you know, because uh, it's you know, with a director I'd worked with multiple times before who had just come off a huge success, who suddenly was uh, given a lot of freedom to uh, do what he wanted. So um, that, that was actually, so the question of, you know, was there a lot of stress? There was less stress than Mimic. So there wasn't a lot of stress. Uh, we, you know, mimic mimic was a was a. I remember the call sheet saying, you know, day seventy nine of fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that should give you a little insight into some of the challenges that were going with, on in that film. With mimic, feel free not to answer this, and we can edit this out. But with mimic, is that a uh, perhaps a classic case of the phrase "we'll fix it in post" coming true? Is it where you just oh, hand it it's stuff almost, where you were like, okay, most, I guess I've got to make a movie. <laughs> and most of Dimensions films were like that. Most of them were were developed in post as opposed to in pre-production. Wow. Um, you know, they would change things. They would, oh, why are they doing this? Let's have them do that. They, they, they made the filmmakers' lives unnecessarily difficult. Um, scream because the script was so good and after the you know the story of the the opening dailies they hated but the opening sequence when it was cut they loved so that backed them off of that and by the time we got to screen two uh wes had a lot of uh control uh and power over that so they so that the screen movies were very unlike any of the other films that jim mentioned did because of that uh, because they didn't have the ability to go in and, and basically wage war on the story. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think Guillermo's original versions of the, or well, the movie that he, that he was making versus the movie that they had in their heads would have been a much better movie as opposed to sort of the hybrid version that it is. Um, you know, uh, Guillermo's a true visionary. He's, you can see that when you look at his work and, you know, he, he has such a, uh, a, a unique point of view. Um, uh, I think Dimension always thought they were getting aliens or giant cockroaches and that's not the movie they were getting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're not here to talk about that, so. <laughs> uh. Sorry, yeah, I got distracted. I always get distracted. Uh, I got a, I got a specific Scream Two question. Go, it's always go. about the Scream movies in general, but Scream Two is something mm. I hear a lot of actors talk about in interviews. Uh, in that, no one at a lot of points is quite sure who the killer is, because mm -hmm. it, it's either kept under wraps or this with Scream Three there was lots of changes and things. But you also talk about when you shoot with Wes, you're doing. Uh, I, I can't remember for to the day or, or up to day editing where you're getting uh, it and you're assembling as you yeah, go. Yeah, you're, you're, you're keeping up to camera. It's, keeping uh, up to camera, that's the expression. Yeah, that's the phrase. Yeah. But when you're trying to keep up to camera in editing and no one really knows what the ending is, like how, how do you work with that? How do you sort of assess the tone and the tempo and the, the tension of a scene when it seems like not anyone is 100% sure where it's going? Um, certainly for Scream 2, that was, an, we knew who the killer was from the get-go i wow. did anyway in the drafts i read <laughs> i don't know if everybody got the whole drafts i can i can't speak to that i can speak to i i had a draft that you know was written on this printed rather on this maroon paper that was so dark you sort of had to tilt it to the light to be able to read it <laughs> um but uh yeah i i knew who the killers were 
uh, because it was really the the thing going into it was who's going who is going to play um, the mother. Yeah. Uh, and Laurie Metcalf was amazing. Um, yeah. uh, and so that was uh, um, knowing that you your job is is um, to try and make it so when it's revealed, it's not a huh. Uh, where did that come from? <laughs> Yet at the same time, it's not so obvious. So I was like, yeah, I saw that coming. No. So it's, it's, there's always a, a, a thing in each scene where, you know, everybody's a suspect, where you're trying to leave it open to think, is it that person is this? So you're looking for little extra looks and things like that. In the first screen, you know, Henry Winkler did all these great little things where you know, like he does this thing where he like touches Nev, uh, where he touches her face or her shoulder, and and he didn't do it every take, but he did one take. So we you know made sure to you know, cut that in because it was just off, right? <laughs> and then the scene with the scissors and stuff, he has these sort of actual looks, and, and we just did that with everybody, trying to make everybody feel suspicious. Certainly, you know, with uh, Jerry O'Connell's character, you wanted. People think, oh, it's going to be the boyfriend again. Uh, um, you know, with the two uh, sorority girls, that was. I never really ever thought it would be them, but no. but you know, we certainly they have a you know some some uh, revelry that may, mm. makes it feel like it might be. Which is which is sort of interesting in a spoiler alert for urban legend, but Rebecca Gayhart goes on to be the killer in that movie. So yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I hear what you're saying. I, I I you know listening to the audio commentary the other day, and it was. I, I, I heard you talk about trying to build up the sorority girls as, as potentially suspicious or at least involved. But I, yeah, deep down, I never really, uh, you know, I guess from my audience perspective, I never felt like anyone really considered them necessarily. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's one of the, it, weirdly enough, it's one of the challenges of, of Scream 4. Now, I didn't work on that because I was doing something else at the time. Um, but I remember going to see it and, uh, you know, at the premiere with uh, Wes and everybody. And, and I remember thinking the only challenge with the reveal of who the killers were is they were both too short. They were both yeah. too small. <laughs> they are very short. And it's just sort of like, hmm, it doesn't work for the suit. It doesn't yeah. work for the killer's persona unless one's on top of the other's shoulders, which, you know, <laughs> <laughs> be fun in and of itself um but that was that was you know laurie metcalf and, and timothy oliphant both of them are of a height and size and stature that you could believe them in that suit at any given time yeah um so that was you know that that to me was you know, certainly billy and Stu definitely feel that uh, uh uh scott foley in the third one um, obviously, I'm shouting major spoilers, but I figure these movies are so old. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Everybody knows, and if you don't, um, now you, now you do. Uh, now you get to go back and look at the heights of all the actors and see if you can figure it out. That's the fun of yeah. it. This time. Yeah, well, because because that's the thing, right? It, it it's something you have to take in consideration. When we did My Bloody Valentine, uh, our challenge was jensen was taller than chris cornell uh who was the wonderful stuntman who passed away last year uh who 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 doubled him so we had to give the stuntman lifts and a big muscle suit and, and, and all these times to try and make match <laughs> yeah. you know try and match him to jensen's height and everything so it didn't feel like it was out of nowhere and part of that was having worked on the screen movies and and, and knowing that that was that was it was a thing that was going to bug me yeah. Uh, yeah, even if it didn't bug anybody else, but yeah. there must be something that that creeps in over years and years and years of getting the footage after the fact and having to sometimes cut around where you're like, oh, well, that doesn't go with that. So now I've got to figure that out. Now that you've transitioned to being a director, yeah. do you constantly have that editor's mind in the background, just being like, oh, oh God, wait, yeah. wait, 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 we can't do that because I know the next shot, and when uh, I put it together, uh, oh, all the time, all the time. Yeah, it it actually. Uh, you know, when you're directing, it's a, it's a very helpful thing to have. Uh, when you get into the cutting room, you're always, you know, even if, uh, I always end up cursing the, cursing the director, even if it's me. <laughs> 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 it's like, damn, why didn't you do that? Or why didn't you do that? And, uh, 
Um, but yeah, you know, Wes was always very clever about all those things because he he had cut when he had, it, it, early on in his career. He had cut some commercials and some trailers and stuff like that, and he had a good editing sense. And I remember him telling me that before um friday the 13th was done he and sean had gone in and, and sort of done the final cut of that of that movie together uh, the two of them um me and sean cunningham so uh uh you know so that he very much he had a very strong strong editorial sense lucky <laughs> <laughs> lucky for him lucky for lucky for us uh Scream, uh, Scream 2 has a tiny little sort of, it's not even an Easter egg. I think it's just a, something that happened on the day that has sprawled out into be fanfare. I'm wondering if you were ever aware of editing the concept that uh, uh, Stu isn't dead because Matthew Lillard was on set for a day of Scream 2. He came to visit and then he's in the background of the fraternity party scene. And now with Scream 5 coming along, the, I don't know if you've seen any, there are fam trailers. There's all sorts of folklore out there now that he's been alive the whole time. He's just horribly scarred from the TV. And he, he's <laughs> going to be, be back. Is that something that you, when you were, you were looking he, at he, it, like, he oh does God, come back, but he has a TV fused yeah. to his head. <laughs> it's like he's one with the TV, like a superhero. Yeah. So he just has an old tube TV <laughs> with the antenna going out, makes it very hard to like, you know, sleep or things like that. There's, there's a whole TV heads too. So it'd be no, I, 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 I never thought that uh, at all, but I knew so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, there was talk of Stu coming back for Scream 3. There was an opening, God, I'm trying to remember. I think there was an opening scene written that had a casting scene and an actor who looked like Stu, who Matthew Lillard was gonna play and something like that. I, I, sorry, I mean, my memory's a little fuzzy, fuzzy on it on it because it, it, it never came to life. It was yeah. one of the many openings that sort of cycled through and, yeah, I think like, the oh, character... we're not doing that one. Yeah, I think the character was Ben Damon, wasn't it? From memory? Um, no, no. Ben, there's a Ben Damon version, but there was there was a but different was... thing beyond that. That, oh, wow. that was actually because it was a very specific thing that he looked like so much like Stu. Okay. Uh, and I believe Matthew Matthew Lillard was going to play it. There, there's an alternate opening of of Scream Scream Three that Kevin wrote, I think that it, that takes place in some house and there's multiple girls and there's like a motion tracker, uh, uh, you know, like uh, like alien and, and there's <laughs> two killers and they kill them both. And there's, there's there, there was some whole thing. I, I remember that, probably have those pages somewhere, but yeah, wow, that's yeah. Crazy. but I remember that version uh, before it went into, then it went into the, into the Ben Damon version. Uh, and then that became Cotton. Right, and then, and was it the the hundred percent cotton? That, that's just a gag, isn't it? That started around. Yeah, that yeah. Actually, that, that, we we uh, Carl Dupre, uh, who wrote Detroit Rock City, was my assistant editor on Scream Two and Mimic, and and uh, and we used to joke around and say it in the cutting room. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, after the the you know the shot where he's interviewed and him wanting all the press, and he should have his own show called the Hundred Percent Cotton, uh, just because it sounded funny and it, it, it lands it's perfect i remember yeah. like when i watched it for the first time i was like that is a perfect name for that show and then i got a bit older and i was like oh it's a joke like it just yeah. it made so it, much sense it, to me i was like oh yeah that's just what he would call it it just yeah it's, it's so perfect in that world yeah, yeah. it's 100 percent cotton <laughs> why, why would you call it anything else yeah it's not like 90 percent cotton 10 percent polyester <laughs> <laughs> So I've got to That's ask. So to say. No, it's not. So I've got to. I've got to ask. Uh, you know, I guess one of the reasons uh, our podcast, our podcast is called Sequel Suck, is hmm. the genesis between you know that scenario that we have in the classroom where Randy and all and Sarah Michelle Gala and Mickey, everyone are there chatting about right. sequels. Um, and I love that scene. I've always loved it, and it's one of these funny scenes too that almost kind of didn't happen because there was an alternate version shot and then it wasn't really working so in your commentary you did mention that the first version which i i'm not having to go at wes or anyone but 
it's definitely not as good as what actually went into the movie, but it's mm. very Randy versus Mickey, you know, almost a, you know, a competition it's, between it's, the two. And like you said it's, in the commentary. It's, it's a little uh, obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm glad, like, at, at what point does Wes or even yourself when you're cutting it, do you go, oh, this is not working or can we do something different or can we reshoot? And, and look, it was smart, I think, getting Sarah Michelle Gellar back so she wasn't just an, a kill. You kind of had a little bit more there. And then Josh Jackson came in and a couple of other, Walter Franks was there. Um, yeah, again, it's a scene I love. And I'm to think that it was almost not in the movie is kind of crazy to me. But, um, like, who makes that decision? Uh, that was a combination of things. It was, it was uh, that scene, the original version uh, was shot early uh in the schedule um and then uh when they were shooting at the back east i can't remember where it was um before they then pulled the rest of the production back to los angeles where they were shooting the exteriors of college and stuff like that um and when they came back um you know we had an assembly of all the footage that they had shot there i think they shot there for three weeks and um and i know that scene didn't really wasn't really working for the producers wasn't totally working for Wes and 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 I think between Kevin and Julie Fleck and everybody they 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 reconceived it on the page and gave Wes a new version and then they while the original shoot was happening um before it was over they reshot that scene yeah um and uh and and the reshoot I think is much much better partially because it's so bright yeah um, there's something about the brightness of it. I think having Josh Jackson in it was really good. Um, you know, uh, Josh, who would later show up in Cursed, and, and I had edited Josh in, in D3, the D3, Mighty Ducks. The Mighty Ducks. Ducks. Yes, oh you did. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> D3, the Mighty Ducks. It's a, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody loves the Mighty Ducks. Especially now that the uh, the the series is coming out, it's having a huge. It's amazing, yeah. Resurgence. Everything kind of, everything old is new again, right? Well, it's uh, it's it's a, a a sticking point for me because in Australia, the first film was released as Champions, <laughs> not The Mighty Ducks, and oh, uh, wow. I've probably wasted more time than I care to admit arguing with people that the first film is called Champions. Like not me, my, <laughs> like Cable and I have oh, an argument. Yeah, wow. I refuse. But I refuse. but you think about it, Champions is actually makes total sense for it. As this title, I'm so happy that you said this because yeah. this is my whole argument. That they're, they're yeah. champions. Doesn't matter what the team's called; they're always champions. That's you will, and, and and they use the 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 Queen song and everything. I don't like that. They certainly yes. use it in the second one. I don't know if they use it in the first. I can't remember. But um, it actually, they, you know, yeah, the Queen song got edited out of the Disney Plus version. I don't think they have the the right, or they didn't want to have streaming rights or something. So there's no "We Will Rock You" and no "We Are the Champions" in the Disney Plus streaming version of Champions. Isn't that nuts? Wow! I, I just rewatched it a couple weeks ago, and I was like, "What? Where is it?" I was waiting for the credits and the swell. It never comes. It's not there anymore. Just a strange That's thing. That's crazy. Yeah, they've uh, they've 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 edited it. They've changed it. They've rewritten history. Monsters. Uh, I want to uh, talk just quickly, if you're happy to, about the idea, like this being a show that is obsessed with sequels, mm. you've worked on a lot of them. And you were on the first Scream, you're on Scream 2, Scream 3. You're also on uh, Straight After Scream 2, an amazing sequel that had a huge effect on me, Halloween H2O. You came yeah. in and you got that, uh, White Noise 2. There's like countless films that you've come in. Is there any sense uh, as an editor that you have to adhere to someone else's ideas when you're coming in, when you haven't worked on the first one and you're trying to match a tone or do you just come in and go, no, I'm just going to do whatever. Or do you feel like you have to oh, yeah, sort of yeah. go back and, and match up anything? Yeah, I think, I think the director sets a lot of the tone, certainly for Halloween. It was, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, Steve Miner was very, uh, eager to recapture the John Carpenter vibe uh, of the original, and uh, so that was a very active thing that we that we did in going in there and in the, in the structure of it. You know, that was a very lean shoot. 
Steve shot nothing extra. There was nothing extra. I mean, that is a short movie, and there's two little scenes that were cut out that I, that um, basically didn't weren't necessary for the story. Um, but it, you know, there. I think I think it's pretty widely known that there was about two weeks before they they started shooting. Um, uh, Charles Dutton was playing one of the cops at the beginning, uh, you know, with uh, um, with Stan Winston's son, and uh, and he had a big part. He had a kill before a daylight kill when the when the shape is when Michael Myers is outside uh, the uh, school, uh, looking in at uh, Michelle Williams' character um, uh, when they're talking about Frankenstein. I think it's what they're talking about. Um, there was a whole thing of Charles Dutton, the character, coming along the outside and the shape killing him, um, which was cut, which was cut out for budget and time. So it just meant that you know the thing was very lean, and, and Charles Dutton got paid and didn't have to be in the movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why not, man? Yeah, you know. Um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, that was a very lean sort of film. It was I, I really enjoyed working on that. I, I think the first scene we cut was the was the nightmare that used some of the original Halloween footage. Wow! Uh, I think the first shot they did of Jamie was her waking up screaming, which was very very much uh, Steve's thing. He wanted to you know say you know there's your screen screen queen, um, <laughs> and so that was the first thing they saw in dailies was that um and yeah and it was just it was fun to revisit that and see those little changes and how they worked in together and, and using using the music and, and certainly using the music at the end of the film was actually from the halloween john carpenter cd uh, oh, wow. and, you know it wasn't a re-record it wasn't you know it was it was you know we pulled it from the cd uh wow. and and uh uh yeah yeah it was it was a fun fun movie that way talking about music something i was listening to an interview recently with one of the producers of the graduate and he was talking about how when they were making the graduate uh, the director was using the temp track that was all simon and garfunkel and then got to the end of putting the film together and went I can't use anything else. I have to, yeah. I have to. And then they had to go to, to sort of war with Paul Simon. He's like, no, and fuck off. And he was like, no, please. And they, they paid a phenomenal amount of money to get it. When you're editing it, I, I'm assuming that you're using temp tracks and you're working stuff mm -hmm. together. You ever find yourself cutting something together with temp track and being like, that is perfect. Please, for the love of God, don't change the music. Don't do anything. Well, like uh, certainly, you know, that's how Red Right Hand got into the whole screen movies is because we yeah. cut that in from the songs in the key of x cd which, uh, which came out in 96 and and uh and cut it in from that in the first movie uh and then you know reprised it in the second movie um but the dewey theme in the second film yeah. the broken, broken arrow broken arrow that yeah. that's how that got in there we <laughs> we um you know marco composed a version uh similar that you actually hear in screen three um you know and he used a, like a he literally used a, a toy piano an old <laughs> antique toy piano that he played a lot of it on um that was very cool um and we sat in the in in the with the music editor bill abbott and we we voted on uh which one to go with whether to use the new version or to or to license the the broken air track and because of all the goodwill of the success of the first film and 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 we previewed it with the broken arrow track oh wow and it previewed incredibly well the the preview audience thought they were seeing phantoms they weren't told oh. we were previewed it in tucson so oh. they were so they were told they were seeing phantoms. And then when we got there, he said, you're not seeing phantoms, you're seeing screen two. And, <sighs> so wow. our scores were good. They were going to be good anyway. So uh, yeah. <laughs> the deck was a little stacked. Uh, Just a touch. Our favor. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and that was a big part of it. So, you know, how well that piece of music played. So, you know, it was a, it was a thing when we, uh, when it came down to the end, you know, Wes, Wes obviously had the final scene ending. We all voted and then, 
it didn't really matter. It was his choice. And, <laughs> yeah. and he, the, the and he chose to do that. And, and they, and they, well, yeah, Wes was, was always very much wanted everybody's input, but, uh, you know, he lent, he lent towards it because it had, we had used it in the first film, um, uh, which is why I used it in the second film. We used it in the first film for, I think Dewey, when he comes up and runs back into the house. Um, all right. And uh, so, so it had all, it had from the very first film been in my mind, part of Dewey's theme. Um, wow. So yeah, then we, you know, we asked uh, if they'd pay for it. I think it might cost like $35,000 um, <laughs> um, to do it. And, and uh, they got permission from the studio. And, and I assume they got, obviously, you know, the composer, whether whatever, Hans Zimmer, whatever right he had or anything, you know, uh, they licensed it and it's in the movie. So so I think, um, I, th I think from memory in the commentary, Wes did say that normally, yeah, it's very unusual for him to get a piece of music from somewhere else. It's been, oh, yeah, movie. very, so, very I mean, unusual. Did you have to twist his arm that little bit more, or was once he got the feedback, no, he was happy to go? No, because it because it, it just worked so well, yeah, you know, it just it just worked, so it wasn't really uh, uh, an arm twist, it was yeah. uh. It was, uh, you know, we would ask the question: Is it possible? Can we actually do that? Can we, yeah. can we, can we license that? Um, you know, I think you can hear at the end the the uh, collective soul. I think is the band, the song at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. um, and it has sort of a violin orchestral intro to it, uh, which may sound a lot like the orchestral part of the Verve song, uh, yes. which was, uh, yes, uh, yeah. because <laughs> that was the song we attempted with. And, <laughs> oh. and um, we tried to license the Verve song and couldn't, you know, that Bittersweet Symphony song, we couldn't license it because they were already in litigation or yes, had lost the litigation with, with, the, with the Stones. Because oh, the Stones, sorry. Was, yeah, it was the Stones. So, if we use their song, which we would need their permission, all the money would go to the Rolling Stones. Yeah. So and they I lost think the they, it's crazy. Yeah. And I think they were like, fuck you. Why, you know, why, yeah. why, they, there's no benefit to us to let you do that. Yeah, yeah. That I'm so glad you said it because for my entire life, every time I've watched the movie, when it, my brain knows it's not Bittersweet Symphony, and then the chords come in, and I'm like, Bittersweet. Oh no, no, that's right. It's not. It's not. I'm so glad I'm not no, inside. But, and that's but, actually what happened. It was. <laughs> uh, for for months and months, it was. Uh, and then poor collective souls, you know. And and uh, I think the the strings were all done by Phil Buckmeister, 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 who did the score for um, Twelve Monkeys. Oh he wow! Just, he did, he oh, did those. Cool. He did those strings, and and obviously Danny Elfman did the the aria. Uh, the other thing. Yeah, for, for Carmen, that's it's insane. Uh, yeah. Another big thing about Screen Two was Wes went back to the kind of new nightmare thing of the movie within a movie, and we have mm. a premiere of Stab which again was the best thing to open the movie with hands down. And I think, again, that's why the, uh, well, I haven't even told you this, Patrick. Scream 2 is my favorite Scream movie. Um, I watched it a lot more than even the first movie, but that opening scene is just fantastic. Um, you know, how, how was like doing that? And, and I, I actually, the other part of the question I was going to go with, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of getting, ugh, um, <laughs> one of the urban legends I think has within the Scream fan community has been that Robert Rodriguez actually directed the no. Heather Graham stuff with Stab, and then obviously you've it, with um, your interview with Ryan Hills, that's obviously been debunked. Which is funny that for so many years people just assumed Robert Rodriguez was the guest cameo director that actually did that as I guess second. He had a director. credit. Wes gave him a yeah. credit, uh, but he, he, you know, he never, I don't even know if he ever even came yeah. on set. He, he, he directed some of Mimic. I can, yeah. I can show you the shots he did. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, the 
know, shots that there's one sequence I think that Robert directs some of and, and JJ authors and, and uh, Tom Burston and, and Rick Boda and uh, Ola Born at all, all had different shots, like little shots in one sequence. I think wow. one sequence is nine different directors worked on it wow. just because it was constantly sort of redone. But you know, in the end, Guillermo crazy. would keep Guillermo would keep reshooting. Everything. So, so it was him. <laughs> so, so we can confirm that Wes shot everything that was stab related Absolutely. as well. Every, every everything that's in that movie from fade up to fade down, uh, Wes directed. Wow, that that's. That's cool. I'd, again, it was one of those things. I think just grew legs, and just everyone assumed that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, but there, there's a reason for it. Yeah. That, that you know, when after Scream uh, came out, um, they were pushing West to direct a Werewolf on Wheels movie yeah. called <laughs> Bad Moon Rising. Yeah. And uh, which was an okay script. It had some really fun things in it. Um, Wes wanted to do some changes. The the writer did not want to do those changes, is my understanding. Um, and uh, then they decided they wanted to do Scream 2. They were talking to Robert about doing Scream 2. Um, and Robert, I think, was very much, well, I don't want to do it if, if, if Wes is, you know, if Wes wants to do it. And Wes said he did want to do it, and the cast wanted Wes to do it, and everything like that. So uh, Robert then was attached to Bad Moon Rising for a while, um, and uh, and Wes was very grateful to Robert for backing out of it, you know, of Scream mm-hmm. Two, so he was so he could do it, and uh, so that there was a title card in the opening film that is directed by Robert Rodriguez, but the studio made us take it out. Uh, but Wes had shot that deliberately as as a nod to Robert. That's such yeah, a strange totally... thing to be forced to pull out. <laughs> like, oh no, well, no. We don't... You, I mean, you know, they were doing other movies with Robert at the time, and you know, Robert was going to go do it. Right? They ended up not doing Bad Moon Rise, but ended up doing The Faculty, and there was, mm. you know, they, they. I think they somehow felt it might be insulting to Robert. I don't think Robert ever felt that. You'd have to ask him. Uh, I don't think you know Robert and Wes's relationship was always good, so it was. It, I, I, I never, quite, I never quite understood the the drama of why we had to take it out. Yeah, uh, I can't imagine a director in the world who would be angry that Wes Craven gave them like a little in joke or some credit. In yeah, a yeah. So, well, and and, and <laughs> that as, sounds a, as a real okay. thank you, and and uh, yeah. but uh, they, you know, they had. No, there was. That's the executives. That's the people who don't get it. There was dr- there was drama. There was drama <laughs> about it. So, and you you uh, cut together all the the stab movie stuff as well, but separately, and then you yeah, we to... got the we got the st- obviously the stab movie first. They shot that beforehand, um, and so we cut the stab movie as a whole. And then because of the way the process went, like that wasn't any there wasn't like green screen or anything like that that's a movie that is in sync with the with the with the film cameras and the film projector so you know in the film the frames are going one per one as they go through at the same oh, yeah. time uh, and so that was projected live in the movie theater is that you know, and every, everybody's reacting to the movie as they're watching is that hell to edit <laughs> to try and be be cutting around two things or was it all nice no because quick? because you're you're cutting the first chunk as a whole and then that just becomes an element in the new footage and then you also have like the first version we cut of uh of of that opening sequence we never went full frame into the movie we only played the movie as as if it was in the theater and then Wes was, this, you know, was very much when we started cutting it. Wes was like, "I want to go full frame in when we're cutting from from Maureen, you know, Jada Pinkett's character, to to uh, Heather Graham's character, to her version of Casey, so that those victims were connected. Yeah. So that that's there's a specific uh, reason for the cutting pattern of how of how it works." Something I've, I've always loved about the the stab movie that we get to see is it's it's so deliberately a, a bad movie. Like it's 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 scream, but it's not scream. It's deliberately meant to be worse than the real movie that you're watching. Well, it's 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 
it's meant to be, you know, based on a true story, horror movie, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know. the, the, way that, the way that it works, and I, I, I credit you with a lot of this, like the editing in it, it feels schlockish in a way that none of the other screen movies do. Like it's those stab movies, it's, it seems like it's deliberately like, oh yeah, when we're going to do this really, really sharp, awkward cut here to this moment here, and then we're going to just randomly cut here. And it just feels so, it feels so much like it's a B movie that's been filmed and cut and put together by a B movie crew that you forget the people who made the actual movie you're watching also made this movie. It's so well, it, it, you clever know, it's how the, different it, you make it feel. Yeah, it's literally the movie within a movie and it, it's designed. And part of that is the reaction of the crowd to watching. Part of that, that what you're, because I don't think that was the intent when it was shot as much as, as, I mean, it was deliberately sort of slicker because it should feel like a, like a movie. Uh, like a movie within a movie, like like what this movie's impression of an actual movie is, you know, the convergence series of, of mirrors <laughs> going down the line. Um, just don't draw the devil on its stomach. Um, if you're a Larry Nevin fan, you'll know what that means. Um, but the, uh, you know, the the crowd reaction to it makes it feel even more like that. You know, it gives it puts it more into the you know the Rocky Horror feel because people are so vocal and so, uh, which previewing the first film and previewing H two O was good. God, that was like that. But previewing the first film was very much like that. Um, although I will say that the the preview that is the was most like the audience in watching the stab opening of Scream Two was the was the first preview of Wes Craven's New Night. A preview oh, was insane. Wow. Like the crowd was so into the film and gasping and screaming and and just it was it was an amazing. That was my first preview I'd ever been to, uh, of a you know, uh, and it was like holy shit, this is. And Wes was like, yeah, they're not normally like this. This was pretty amazing. Well, that movie, like that movie, was so big. My my mom is a huge horror fan, which is how I went up mm. watching horror. And that movie was so big, and people loved it so much. I remember the second it came out on VHS, my mom showing it to me when I was way too young to watch it because she was just so excited about this movie. She's like, this is amazing. Like this movie is special. There's something so different about it. And it's, it's, and I've like, I've never seen a, a Nightmare on Elm Street film. I'm a child. And she was like, no, 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 you can watch this one. Cause it's like it, but it's different. Anyway, child, it. It's right. So you can yeah. relate, you know, they're talking <laughs> to you. You might That's wake it. up, you know, with knives attached to your fingers. And <laughs> Wes was a little worried about that. Cause it's, it's very, it's very instructive in a way that yeah. uh, I don't know if we should actually you know forget the tongues come out of the phones and stuff like that it's a little kid taping steak knives to his fingers that that's where you like um yeah. oh no i, yeah. I made a pretty good in, in, in my youth i got like a rubber glove and got some butter knives and sticky tape them on and mom was like well at least you use butter knives that's yeah that's, uh, yeah i, I applaud that you were I you were you were clearly <laughs> clearly a, a sensitive young lad <laughs> very concerned about not hurting anyone yeah yes good for you <laughs> another uh, i keep tracking cable if you got more questions yeah I, I, another great scene in the movie which is one that's i guess probably loved and hated for the fact that it was randy's death scene oh, um just yeah. this in the commentary i again it was pretty ballsy like i'm sure it may have happened in a horror film at some point but to have broad daylight open oh. space um I mean, even for that, like, how how was editing that? Like, I'm not so yeah. It, it was, you know, that was a fun scene to cut. I I remember reading it and imagining that there would be like 300 extras on the quad, mm. right? That there would be yeah. packed with people, and then seeing it is just like, oh, there's not a lot of people there, and and wondering how well that was going to work, and and piecing it all together. You know, so many of those scenes are all about misdirection it's the thing that's sort of hidden there the whole the whole scene is just waiting um uh and the 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 decision to kill randy who was such a great character in the first film and who clearly you know had this unrequited uh love of sydney and everything like that you know that was a that was a that was a big thing 
and uh, as the sort of center point kill of the film. Um, you know, West has shot it really well, so it, it wasn't hard to cut. Yeah. It was certainly sound wise, you know, with the phones and everything like that, you're trying to uh, piece all that together. And, um, um, but it, it went together really well. I think uh, for me, even though I was absolutely devastated at the time, I think the death of Randy actually does give it, and I think you and Wes say it on their commentary, it does, because so many people love that character, it just gives, mm. real, realism is probably not the best word, but it just means it, yeah, everybody's on the table, anyone can well, get killed. You, yeah, you, you've made everybody, everybody susceptible to death. Yeah. It's the and, wrong word, but you know what I mean. No, absolutely. And I, and, um, and I think too many horror, too many horror movies these days, or even the, the genre in general, I think, unfortunately, doesn't build up enough of the characters for you to actually start to feel an emotional connection to them before you kill them. So when a lot of these characters yeah, do yeah, die in movies, true. um, you know, when they do die, it's it's like, eh, okay, that's that was. I don't have well, any. Care. Whereas. That's where screen works and, and Kevin's yeah. writing where's his direction and even the actors coming and just giving their all. I just feel like there's always this connection with all the characters right through the movies that at least you have something and then when they die, it actually means something. Yeah, it's it's a really important thing that you have to, you, you know, a, a film that does that really beautifully that has so many characters in it is is uh, Battle Royale, the Japanese film. Okay. Um, you know, you you see all the characters in the very beginning, but you don't really know anybody, you know, the main sort of three. And then and then you would get like a vignette where you meet the character, see, you know, re-meet the character, have a flashback of the character and kill them all within five minutes but you would set it up so that you had an emotional value, you know, emotional resonance with the character. I, I think, you know, if you look at uh, Alien Covenant, talk about sequels, mm-hmm. um, it's a gorgeous movie and, and there's some great stuff in that movie. And, and if you look at the deleted scenes of that movie that are on the Blu-ray and stuff like that, you go, will you cut out all the scenes that make me well, that would have made me like yeah. these people when they died. Yes. So now when I watch these people, when I watch it without knowing that, I don't give a shit about any of them. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you killed mustache guy and <laughs> beard guy and and whiny woman and and yeah. it, like it does they don't they don't mean anything, which is you know, when you watch the deleted scenes, you're like, oh my God, you had it all. You had all these great scenes that yeah. would have would have made you love these people and made me understand their journey of why I care. Yeah. Um, so that was something, you know, Wes was always very passionate about. You know, he felt in the first film that, that, that Kevin's writing was so great of making Casey such a, and what, you know, in, in the second film, you know, uh, uh, Maureen and Steve, you know, of Omar Epps and Jada Pinkett, like you meet them, you get sort of a full life with them. They mean something to you and then you kill them. But then when you come to the next, like like in the first film when we previewed it, when you suddenly meet Sydney and Sydney's attack in the house, people were sure you were going to kill her because you had already shown, yeah, we'll kill people. We'll kill, you know, whoever you want. You know, we there's no, nobody is safe and killing Randy reintroduced that that feeling that nobody is safe anybody could die at any moment and you're right i mean bringing it back to the drew barrymore character of casey becker i mean who would have ever pictured that someone would have drew barrymore in their movie and kill her in the first 10 minutes like that's Uh like a huge shock so then you're right that just raises the stakes and well hang on courtney cox is a pretty she was on the up and up after friends well she could die in any minute any minute uh David Arquette, like there were so many actors in there that you go, well, if Drew Barrymore can well, die David in the first Arquette, minutes, David did die at the end of the first movie and, and we well, loved yes. him so much in that joy. We begged, you know, Wes to shoot the shot of him being loaded in the ambulance. And, oh, wow. and because there's another version where he's dead when he's wheeled out. Yeah. And uh, we, we just we just never cut that in. <laughs> we just always cut, cut Dewey being alive because uh, we love Dewey. And then it becomes the running gag that Dewey always almost yeah. dies yeah. every movie now. And somehow yeah. he's good. He's Superman. 
Yeah. It's, yeah. it's amazing. I guess that's an interesting uh, part of uh, the editing process and, and the decision making on who, who sort of survives because the first leaked strip of Scream 2 had a lot of people dying and not many people left at the end. Um, whether that actually would have really come, you know, come to see the light of day ever, who knows, Wes would have made that decision at some point. But I feel like there was. You know, there was talks of uh, Cotton would have died at the end. Uh, Sydney would have died at the end. Um, there was a lot of death in that last bit, and Hallie, Hallie and Derek were in on it, and they were the killers. I mean, that was a pretty crazy Yeah, end. I v- vaguely remember something like that. But uh, certainly, you know, that that was never shot. No, of course not. Yeah, you know, that was the reality was was what we, you know, I remember Kevin saying that the police car sequence with Hallie was a scene that he had originally written for um, I Know What You Did Last Summer. And the director of that mm-hmm. film said it wouldn't work or didn't believe it would work or wasn't behind it or something like that. So uh, my apologies to Jim Gillespie if that's incorrect. Um, and that, so we put it in screen two and Wes just like, sure, it'll work. That'll be great. Yeah. You know, climbing over <laughs> the killer and stuff like that. That'll be fantastic. And it's so suspenseful. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you the scene now. You can't imagine. Oh my God. It will be like, oh, that's not scary. <laughs> yeah. Is, so it's, and it, and it's bright, right? They're under street lights and everything. It's not dark. That seems yeah. like you're just, it's in your face. You're just watching it. So, yeah. Yeah, there's That's nothing crazy. hidden there. It's it's a very effective piece of suspense. Well, speaking of uh, scenes of suspense, the other one that I love, and it's visually I love it, um, sound-wise I really love it, but when Gail actually goes into uh, the recording studio at um, oh yeah, and yeah. she's walking between the walls and, and moving, and, and Wes did talk about using the whole frame to actually have, you know, ghost face, you know, on one side and she could go around the wall and all that sort of stuff. And then obviously you have Dewey get killed and she's screaming, but, and you talked about that creative decision not to hear her scream because she's behind yeah. the glass. I love that scene so much. Um, yeah. So good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. I thought that was a, a great piece of directing from Wes and, and, and really effective how it all went together. And, and um, and again, you know, Courtney and, and, and David dying again, uh, um, you know, all that's, the, they've been great in that. You know, Courtney does a great job. In- yeah, absolutely. Um, Angus? I was, I was just going to say, I was, it's uh, tangentially Scream 2, it's moving into Scream 3, just a, a, a picadillo I've always had with Scream 3. You talked about it in an in interview that, that great first scene with Patrick Dempsey where Kincaid, where he didn't know mm. if he was the killer or not. And the way he plays it is so yeah. on the money. And then throughout the film, it's kind of what's going on. And then by the end of the film, he's almost he, Sydney's boyfriend. I don't know. And then he just is gone. He's the only surviving character from a screen film who doesn't come back in the next one. Was there ever any scene that you, you know, a shot scene or a suggested scene where you were going to kill Kincaid, where you showed what the hell happened to him because it's such a happy ending. And then he's just, uh, well, no, yeah, I mean, there was a version of the ending where he wasn't there where he wasn't with her at the end. So that was shot. There was a, 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 a version where she goes up and looks at the open door by, by herself. He's, and he's not part of that scene. Uh, and the version with him uh that was also shot early on in the shoot so it was like well we don't know what their chemistry is going to be like but you know that first scene with with patrick and, and now was fantastic yeah uh how could anyone be concerned uh, about chemistry with patrick dempsey <laughs> oh yeah well they, you know this was this was uh pre gray's anatomy so oh, but he was pretty dreamy that's it. Yeah, uh, and he was and he was great in it really intuitive and really interesting um and uh there we could have manufactured editorially an ending where he died in the house in in the house with uh um, you know at roman's hand that that ability did exist for us but we didn't we didn't craft it that way just because we liked it 
you know, we looked at the the alternate ending of, oh yeah, this is it without him. Let's put him in. Let's preview it with him in and see what the reaction is. We know we can take him out, but let's see. And when we previewed the audience, uh, um, oh no, we didn't preview the third one. No, you didn't. We but we screened it. We screened it internally, and and the reaction was from everybody was we wanted to keep Patrick. Yeah, um, I can't imagine anyone is is banging for yeah. him to, to die. <laughs> yeah, especially the way yeah. he played this movie. Because when you finally find out he's not the killer, like there is such a sense of relief as an audience. We're like, oh, good, because I oh, like I don't want him not, to be we're bad. We're not betrayed again. <laughs> yes, and see, I like I will never recover from finding out that Timothy Oliphant was was the villain. I've I've always been in love with Timothy Oliphant as an actor, and and having to sit through that movie and know it's him, it just. Not you too, yeah, Patrick. Yeah, I couldn't he, do it. His, his unmasking is good, you know. That's uh, oh, and that, that that that. Oh my God! What's that? The 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 big singing scene in in the cafeteria. Oh, oh I, I think I love you. Oh yeah. uh, man! Oh, that song. Just that song gave me nightmares for because you hear it over and over when you're cutting it. Yeah, yeah. I hear well, that song now, the, and it's just really like, oh, oh. Well, I was going to ask you that because that you do say that in the commentary that that was the hardest scene of the movie to edit because yeah, you had yeah. obviously um, Jerry O'Connell singing in different key and then you've got the crowd, they got the clapping and all the different shots and trying to match it all Everything. together. Is, it was just, it, you had to spend so much time on something that was just, uh, you know, um, uh, it worked perfectly for the movie. It's a, you know, cute song and I, I totally get it. And, and if I never hear it again, I'll be, I'll be happy. <laughs> Imagine you in the editing room, you're like, Wes, you better kill this character. You better kill him dead. I no, no. I, 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 although I did, I did love his death. I thought it was great. The way, oh, it's when, brilliant. When, the way Mickey shoots him, just like oh. totally badass and just, yeah. and, you know, and he dies on the, uh, you know, basically crucified on the sun. Yeah. It's just like, huh. Well, there you go. That's a, that's a cinematic ending. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful ending to to his his uh, lovely, foppish, gentle character. Just getting one of the more yes. the more horrific deaths in the entire. Yeah, story. no, he, he has a, he has a uh, a good death, and it's you know it's the death when the killer's uh, unmasked as well. So, um, and I love his sort of trying to convince her that that. He that uh, Jerry Connell's character is in on it, right? Yeah. You know, when Timothy Oliphant's so like, good. "Oh, do you know why you do that? Why?" You... And it's just like, "Oh, so I mean, it's such a evil mind fuck." Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I love the ending with when Cotton shows up, you know, with Laurie Metcalf, and he makes the deal. Oh, yeah, and uh, it's just sort of like because all he's got all the cards. It's just like. And what and fun. it's yeah, Cotton uh, Cotton was great in that movie. What a fun, like what a, a brilliant coincidence that from a tiny little background yeah. moment in yeah. this movie, the actor who you happen to get to play that small character would be Lev Shriver, who would go on to be one of the great actors of this generation, but yeah. also an insanely good addition to the next movie. Like yeah. that's that's gotta be one of the all time greatest. Yeah. It, just that that just moves. worked out great yeah um and 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 you know he was somebody who i think the the studio the uh, dimension had wanted west to have his cotton and flew out for that shot and then uh, because they had they had they were doing something else with him I, I i can't remember what i think he was doing something on the merrimack side but i can't i can't remember um uh, but he was somebody they had an eye on who they thought was going to be uh an actor to watch and they were right you know it was fantastic yeah what a what a brilliant thing no recasting no careful editing no it's no like, no it's just that bit well, part. Makes everybody like very clever <laughs> <laughs> west knew all along you guys where you're putting yes, it together, yes, like we, everybody was so smart we knew. yeah we were <laughs> it'd be a sequel we knew we'd need him we were just setting yeah. it up yeah it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, not even close. But you know, happy accidents are are, are yeah. all good. That's know? that's how that's how movies are turn into great movies. It's just happy accidents, yeah. one after the yeah. other, and suddenly, bam! Well, it's 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 you you somehow you know it's that lightning in a bottle thing. Yes. Yeah, one hundred percent. I was I was going to bring that up, and and the fact that you know you have this throwaway character almost in screen 
screen called Cotton Weary that's, you know, like you said, you're seen in, in just, I guess, news footage and then go, oh, hang on, we can actually use this character and, and make it work for the second well, movie. And he has such know, a big part and an important part. That, a lot of that was Kevin who had that yeah. in mind. And, and I, re I remember Wes always saying how much he loved the names of Kevin's characters, how he just like Kevin names his characters. They're just great names. Like Cotton Weary is a great name. And I think that the name itself made sure that that character was going to come back. It's also, it's like great character names that also at no point stand out as being absurd. Like if you say the name yeah. Cotton Weary yeah. over and over again, you're like, that's, yeah. it, that's a ridiculous name, but yeah. it never jumps out. And none of the movies jump out. Uh, the, the yeah, names it's not, it's not like perry roden or, or, or you know rodan or or yeah. you know, luke skywalker or yeah, so. you know whatever which is sort of stands like, out right you know like as Randy a oh. meeks. you know the meek character yeah. is called meeks and at no point yeah. does anyone go oh i get it you're like yeah that's just his name it just makes sense yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i know mm -hmm. that it's it, they're all very well named and very appropriate and, Gail Weathers. Yeah. yeah. It's, At yeah. least they referenced that one. <laughs> that one I don't yeah. think they could quite get away with. They had to bring it up. Yeah. I mean it's 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 pretty it's pretty pretty smart. It seemed like from talking to you today, it's when when we talk about the screen films, you seem to still have such genuine affection and joy and delight in recounting them, even though I can only imagine like when you're in it, it's like it's work, it's assembly. You're you're putting together this film. Oh yeah. 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 It's it, it's yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you feel it with most of the stuff you've been lucky enough to work on, or is it? Do these films in particular hold a special place in your heart? Be like, this was just, this is just great stuff. Um, both. You know, I, I remember a lot of about the things I've worked on, but those films certainly are films you talk about a lot. They they were um, the first one in particular was a unexpected success that changed the lives of everybody involved. You know, that that film is what gave me a chance to direct and gave me, you know, uh, of a whole career because of that experience. Um, and I think for Wes, it changed, you know, the trajectory of his career. I think for a lot of the actors, it did the same. And it's, you know, that, that becomes a, a very, uh, you know, it's the nexus point of one of those nexus points in your professional life. Uh, that oh shit, you know, you know your personal life. It's you know whether it's you know, getting married or having children. You know, those are all the big moments. Um, you know, in your professional life, that's the that was definitely one of them for sure. That's definitely my life. getting married, having children, and seeing Scream. Those are the ones that. that <laughs> yes. That yes. Like, oh. So I can understand how you would feel the same. Yeah. <laughs> big three. That's all you need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Something I wanted to actually touch on as well, um, and I don't know if it was a bit of an in-joke with you and Wes in the commentary or this was a true thing, but he said your favourite line from Scream 2 was when uh, Mickey says Billy's mother. Oh, yeah. Billy's so mother. Yeah. <laughs> such a good and, delivery. <laughs> it's such a good delivery. Yeah, and we used to make fun of it. And, yeah. and we used to, yeah, because it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the way he, he looks up is the same in your neck. He looks up and you sort of expect his jaw to unhook like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, I was thinking, is it? something you just got sick of seeing in editing that um we no, but just that's, that's yeah, the, you but... know what i was rattling off those those lines of of ed asner's from a movie i kind of yeah. certain scenes and lines of dialogue get stuck in your head uh yeah. you know and they and they don't they just don't leave you know yeah. you've you've heard them so many times you've seen them so many times they 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 they're they become like a part of your dna yeah um you know that and and each one of those films are certain things that that just uh latch on to you and don't let go uh and this and you just sort of drag them around behind you or you know carry them in as you know their 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 little tattoo on the inside of your skull yeah um and that that is one of there's lots of that you know in the, in those movies yeah uh, that are that so are you once you've edited a movie, you've seen it a million times as you're cutting? Mm. 
do you, the first time you get to see it, whether it's with Wes or with an audience or what have you, can you enjoy it watching it for the first time? Or do you, what's your first experience when you get to actually sit down, your hands are off, off the dials and all that sort of stuff, and you get to just relax, popcorn, whatever you got to do. Yeah, drink certainly, and- certainly a preview is not a relaxing thing. That's yeah. just terrifying because you're you're <laughs> a back then they were on film right so yeah. your only hope was every frame went through the projector yeah. uh, it's like i don't care like please just don't melt um yeah. because because a uh, new nightmare when we did our run through we, we there was a paper splice that had been left in and it caught the film melted oh. and it was like oh and we had to try and get a reprint before the preview you know do a run through oh, in the afternoon man. so somebody's racing from Torrance to Burbank and trying to get back and cutting it in on the platter and replattering and hoping it's in sync. Yeah. Wow. Um, but when it's finally finished and you finally watch it, I think the for Scream, the screening that I loved was watching it uh, when I uh, I was way cutting Mimic in Toronto, flew home for Christmas, and then I had to fly back for New Year's before New Year's, because you ever wanted to cut on New Year's Day. Um, and and just right around then, when, because Scream, when it first opened, didn't, it hadn't been done so yeah. well. And then it gained momentum again, momentum again, momentum. Um, I saw it um, in Toronto with a packed house. And there, you know, it's, it's the movie is the movie. You're not, you're no longer responsible for it. Yeah. There's, a, there's always a point where, it, where, okay, it is now unleashed into the wild. I don't have to catch it. I don't have to, you know, uh, uh, vaccinate it or, or tag it or, you know, mark it with a camera. Or This is no longer my responsibility. And so you just sort of enjoy it. And that really was just enjoying the audience reaction to it. Oh, that's and cool. Watching people sort of like, yeah, that was, that was fun. Yeah. Oh, me personally, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I did short films back in my old mm. uni days and you know editing for me i enjoyed parts of it but it is very tedious at times as well yeah but i always felt like even when we finished the movie and you know we see it on the big screen for the first time with an audience you're right i just get nervous and i cringe and then i i, I overanalyze what i could have done are you oh yeah you sometimes uh, say, oh, you, so you can sit there and watch it the first time and go, oh geez i could have done that better or, or oh god yeah, yeah there's oh. movies that i uh, that i to this day, I recut fucking Dracula 2000 in my head. And, oh, wow. and like over and over, it's like, oh, why the fucking damn it? God, God. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, and I remember Nightmare Cafe going through it, and there was like a few edits in that that was just like, oh, I, I can never watch that again. That's, those edits just, like, how could I have done that? And, and, uh, and I remember Wes saying, oh, that's fine. It was, and it was a mismatch on a door swing. It's oh like, wow! Well, you can't you can't cut that that way. And he's just like, no, no, it's fine. You're just watching them. You're not looking at the door. It's just like, oh, all I see is the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see nothing but the door. Um, <laughs> and in your nightmares, ever since the door. The door. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I remember it to this day. I can <laughs> yeah. still see it. Like, oh, that door swing is out. Um, uh, and Wes would do a really interesting thing every time we were about to lock picture uh on every every movie that we did together and and there was a lot of them over the years you know for almost 20 years we worked together right like the day before whatever we do one final pass for the movie and he would do some sort of radical change and everything that's just like what what? we're gonna but how how will we know if we like that we're just gonna lock it and send it into the you know we're, we're that means we're not coming back i mean yeah, no, I, I've been thinking about it for a while and I sort of, you know, think maybe we should, just, <gasps> but he was always right. It just would scare the living shit out of me to do it. Because uh, <laughs> it's just like, boy, you, boy, you mean we're not going to think about it or live with it or come back and look and go, well, was that right? We're just going to assume we're right? And he had, he had the confidence to do that. So, yeah, it was a valuable thing, but it would always scare the shit out of me. It's it's a fun way to to be for twenty years. Where you like every day that you're going to work, you're like I know on the last day he's gonna do it, and then you get well, yeah. It. Well, it you're became tough. a thing. I didn't know it. I didn't know at the beginning, and then you see the pattern. I was like, oh fuck, here we go. All right, 
Let's 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 hope we don't do anything really, really. Let's hope we don't mismatch the door swing, because <laughs> that was one of those. <laughs> the, the title of your autobiography: "Don't mismatch yeah. the door swing." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm aware you're being very generous with your time and I don't want to hold you here forever, but I said a couple other things I want to talk about quickly. Uh, you got to direct an episode of the Screen TV series recently. Yes. Yeah. That must have yeah been... Back in 2016. So well, five years well, ago now. God. Far out. Was it really 2016? All yep. right. Yeah. Have to yeah it, was, it, was, it was really 2016. <laughs> the world has, uh, has I, I have, uh, I have a six year old and a two year old. So, like days and weeks and years, they're all the same. Thing oh, now. yeah. Just, yeah. It'll be yeah. like that till they're 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're, we're coming in and working on, on the, I guess, the child of the universe that you had such a large hand in helping to create, was it sort of a homecoming or was it a surreal experience stepping into what is not the same world, but the this universe now that it's expanded into and, and being handed? No, it was great. Right? To, uh, yeah, it was, they had originally talked to me about uh, coming in to do the pilot episode, but I ended up having to decline because I had to, um, I was committed to the Terminator movie at yes, the time and writing 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 that so i uh and 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 writing what a sequel that would never get made <laughs> uh to that movie so that that uh prevented me from doing that so when they came back around and said hey would you come come do the sort of season ender uh i was like absolutely i would love to do that so you know that was great fun to come back to that and you know when we and we talked about specifically, you know, the police, the, the police car and, and, you know, being a little uh, reminiscent of the police car in Scream 2. And there was a few things like that in the, in the, in the thing where we talked about different things like that. And the cast was, was lovely to work with and, and the DP was great. And, you know, it was a really, really fun experience. And you spent the whole time just going, just match that goddamn door. Just match that door. I'm going to yeah, shoot it. Yeah. Cut it well, right. I, I, I remember because I didn't, you know, Dan Riddle, who, who cut the episode, uh, I, I would be very specific in my notes. And at one point he says, well, do you want to just do it? I was like, no, I won't do that. <laughs> I just, but I did move closer and closer and closer to him. It's just it's like, uh, but yeah, he was a great editor. I mean, he is a great editor. He's not dead or anything. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he did a really good job cutting it. But but it was uh, yeah, it was a slightly better version of it, you know, because it goes through like the studio notes and then the network notes, uh, which was MTV at the time. Different notes. There was a, I think, an earlier version that Dan cut. Uh, the opening was longer, but you're limited by time. But that whole sort of escape from the thing was longer but they had to make more room for talk so so something's got to go well that, that what you were talking about there actually leads me to the next thing i want to ask you about saying that you, you know do you just want to cut it uh and with what actually was recently <laughs> relatively speaking trick uh with mm. the, you wrote and you directed it looks like this is one of if not the first thing you had no no part of cutting in in your uh, film. I did, I didn't take a credit for cutting it. I had I had an avid and 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 I did the same on on uh, Flesh and Blood the uh, Hulu Into the Dark movie from Blumhouse uh, the year before that. And um, Tommy Agar cut Trick and and I uh, did some uh, guest editing for certain scenes. And, and <laughs> like, like I, I I you know Tommy did a great job editing it. And I, I remember the opening scene uh, of Trick uh, sort of, well, I just want to fiddle with it. And, and, and so I just made it slightly more frenetic <laughs> um, and crazier. Um, it's a, you know, it's the, a very crazy opening. It's, yeah. Uh, and the opening was uh, that whole party sequence was, was shot in eight hours. Um, wow. It was Oh man, we had, a, we had a the movie was very low budget, and we had a very very lean schedule. So um, it was yeah, it was a, a balls to the wall race. We had great DP, and 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 uh, she operated everything. Amanda Trey, she yeah, she did it, and the cast was great. None of them left set at all. You know, it's a nice thing about working with the young cast. You know, I know Wes found that in the cast of Scream, working with the young cast, he really enjoyed it because there was such enthusiasm for the for the mayhem <laughs> yes. mayhem is an excellent word for this yeah. film. 
And uh, yeah. you, you did something in this film that uh, to, has become to me a hallmark of someone who loves horror and who is aware of the history of horror. And you cast Tom Atkins in this movie. Oh, and I think any, anytime I see a movie and he's in the, the credits, I'm like, oh, this director knows what's up. This director yeah. is- very, Yeah, well, I, I've worked with, that was my third time working with Tom. And, and I, I, I love Tom. And, and well, he and I, uh, frequently we'll, we'll email or call or mail back and forth and, and express our love for each other. I met him on Valentine, my bloody Valentine. And uh, of course, we shot in Pittsburgh and he, he uh, lives there and uh, has lived there for a long time and does a lot of theater there and movies and stuff. And, uh, and I set up a meeting with him and, and just, uh, you know, we just chatted like we'd known each other for 30 years. It was fantastic. Uh, uh, Tom Atkins. I mean, I remember him in Rockford Files and uh, obviously Night of the Creeps and The Fog and, and, and uh, Escape from New York. Three. And, uh, Halloween 3. Oh, you got to love that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he just he's just the loveliest human. And uh, so uh, I, I will keep working w uh, with Tom as long as I possibly can uh because he's he's a, he's a, he's a he's a great person and and has been doing this for such a long time you know he's in his 80s now and um you know his his stories about coming up in theater in new york and working with like john casal uh Cazal, uh before he died and and um wow. doing theater with him and it's it's pretty amazing guy to talk to yeah, lots I of great history there. Can only every time I've ever read an interview with him or heard him on a podcast, I'm like, I just I wish that I just you were my next door neighbor and we could just hang out. Yeah, no, <laughs> he's he's somebody you fall in love with. It's just just it's like oh Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, in Trick, which I, I watched last night and loved, you also uh cast Omar Epps and Jamie Kennedy <laughs> being yeah, in Plastic yeah. Home coming to Scream too. Yeah, no, it was great fun to 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 have them both in the movie. They I don't they had seen each other since Scream Two. Wow. Uh, um, and and saw each other uh, when we were doing the hospital stuff in the beginning. And uh, yeah, they were both great. You know, Jamie, Jamie. Uh, obviously, he had a smaller smaller part. His mother had had passed away um, at the beginning of our shoot before he had come. So you know, we condensed everything for him and. And um, but and I had asked if he if he wanted to you know us to recast or anything and he was like no I want to come work and and uh, and it was great to have him there it was just like oh home week how is how is George Jamie and Omar and I and you know he was in Scream too and I'd had Omar in uh, uh, Dracula two thousand and 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 loved working with Omar and it was great to have him back and and uh, for this whirlwind thing and and you know those they those two guys made it easier and you know they, we were lucky to have them yeah it was it was nice seeing them in the same movie and then you didn't kill omar in the first 30 seconds like i could he get to didn't, hang didn't, around this time didn't, didn't kill omar at all uh, yeah uh, although editorially we could have uh, <laughs> he certainly he certainly at one point died in the script uh, uh you know originally uh Gerba maroney was going to play that part but because of our schedule being pushed back uh, uh dermot was no longer available uh because he was doing a show in london and a show in georgia and a show in la and we just we butted up against all his conflicts and we couldn't make it work um and so i reached out to omar who was who was available and and said sure i'll come do it so i was thrilled that we had omar come in uh, and do yeah, it. but the dermot's Dominic. biggest contribution is don't kill denver <laughs> 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 um so omar lives because uh, because of that <laughs> amazing amazing i love it uh it's uh cable is there anything else you want to you want yeah, to i've got two last questions so um okay so patrick screen five did you get any you know phone calls were you reached out to or that was just they've moved on and i i all I'll say is I'm incredibly excited to see it and incredibly excited for everybody else to see it. I think it, I think it will be an amazing film. So you may have seen some of it or I, I, I just, <laughs> what I said is all oh, I'll say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think <laughs> that, well, that, great, that, uh, great filmmakers and great producers and, and really great writers and, and have a real affinity for the material. I've known Jenny Vanderbilt for a long time, and 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 I, I think I think uh, the the future of the franchise is in excellent hands with that whole team. That's. Very good to hear. Yeah. Very that's, good to hear. That's a very diplomatic answer. That's a very I'm not getting sued by anyone today answer. I love it. <laughs> no, I, I no. but I, I yeah. fully believe that. I think yeah. that's very true. That sounded genuine to me, didn't it? I guess. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I'm not disputing that's genuine. Um, I guess one of my last sort of points, uh, last questions. Um in this day and age of uh physical media and and home cinemas. A lot of movies are now transitioning to 4K or getting remastered for 4K. Um, and a lot of that process and tick of approval comes from the director. And unfortunately, Wes is no longer with us. Are you the next best person to come to when it comes to putting the Scream trilogy in 4K? And uh, again, you being so integral at looking at all this, the key elements of putting them together, would you be the person that they would come to or you hadn't even thought about it? I have no idea, to be honest. It ne never even occurred to me. I, I, I think they would go to Tina Anderson, who, who worked in post and all the movies and has been a, an amazing post producer on, on you know, um, Quentin Tarantino's last few films. She, she was an Argo. She's uh, just a tenant. You know, she's brilliant, but she started, you know, she was our post PA on D3, The Mighty Ducks, yes. uh, wow. and then came and worked on screen with us and, and moved up and is amazing. I would think they would go to her, to, to Tina, to set it all up. I think um, if they were to ask me to be involved, I, I would think, you know, uh, uh, whether it be myself and Peter Demings and the, the director of photography and, and Kevin Williamson, you know, that yep. sort of certainly uh, 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 Troika, that would make sense to me. Of yeah. People who, who have a lot of uh, knowledge of it uh, yeah. to do that. If, if they, if they didn't just do it themselves, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Yeah, we just made it 4K because we're gonna get more money. But uh, yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> well, I just say again, again, as a movie fan, and, and Angus is is definitely in the same boat as well. And I, I sadly don't tell my wife. I spend probably too much money on 4K and different movies. But the, one of the great things is a lot of these cult films and, and and really popular movies that people love so much that they do. Uh, you know, these companies that now own the properties before they release it, they make sure they, you know, when they do the 4K scan that they do pretty much get a tick of approval, whether it's Spielberg or Wes or George Lucas mm. or Joe Dante. Yeah, they that makes get, total sense. They want the movie to be the best it can be and they want it you know, signed off on. So I just sort of thought to myself, well, Wes is no longer with us. I think you being the one that actually oversaw a lot of, you know, of obviously editing that you would have almost one of the best visions to say, yeah, this is the right well, color grading, I, I, this is the I, right scan. Yeah, I would certainly, you know, if the, if I was asked to do it and nobody has done so, I would I would think that, you know, Peter Deming, the director of photography and and, and uh, uh, whether it be myself and, uh, you know, and Kevin would be the, the three people that would probably do it. Uh, that, would be my thought on that. And, and I, I hope they, I hope it's worth and like you said, I, I mean, I hope they do that. I hope they have that. Yeah, first and, and, if, and if and if they didn't do that, if they just went to Tina uh, Anderson to do yeah. it, I would trust her with my life. So yeah. she would. Uh, well, she yeah, she could do any of that. Well, as a fan, I just hope they do go to one of you you people that have you know that have been on the movie and experienced it and know how it should be viewed and how Wes would have wanted the movie to come across yeah. in that yeah. media. I just yeah, you're right. I hope it's not a cash grab when Scream Five comes out that they bring. Well, out the... I suspect that's when it will appear. So when yes. uh, Scream Five's coming out next year, so mm. so I suspect I suspect uh, uh, somebody's going to be seeing an opportunity. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and that's and that's why well, I just hope they just do justice to those movies and yeah, and yeah, I do too. The right I, I, they're 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 certainly, uh, I think they're very special to a lot of people, and 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 
and in even in terms of their own film history, uh, the first one especially have you know real significance. Absolutely, amazing. Uh, I was just going to say uh, as we're wrapping up. Uh, what, what can we can we look forward to? I know COVID is, is absolutely devastating the world, and, and yeah, you know everything's sort of gone in a little bit slow. Well, I have a few things that uh, that uh, are are getting you know close to getting on the runway, so we're hoping that things happen. Um, uh, doing something with uh, Adam Hendricks and Divine Conquer, who did uh, 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 produced uh, Freaky and and the Black. Christmas remake and uh, they did the Into the Dark film that I did and, and got something with them that I'm very excited by. So um, hopefully is it, that. Is it No Mercy for a Skunk Pig? Cause that's the, that's the film. No, it know. is not. No Mercy really for a Skunk Pig. No, 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 it's not. It is. <laughs> I read that. It's and I was like, something wow. else totally different that I have been <laughs> wanting to, uh, wanting to make for uh, about 30 years. So. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, knock on wood, the spheres may be aligning. All right, I'm going to cross <laughs> cross all my uh, my fingers and toes. Uh, I think I think that's that's probably all that we can hold you for. We've had you for so long. Uh, I do have I have one one final short question for you, Patrick. Uh, hmm. Do do sequels suck? Sequels do not suck. Yeah, sequels don't suck, and remakes don't suck. Remakes do not suck. Remakes rule. Because the should, thing, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Fly, remakes. The remakes are mm. uh, the ones that you love more than the original. And, you know, My Bloody Valentine. Not to, well, I, not I, to, I, not I, I won't, play, I won't do you that. Should you should definitely yeah. check out My Bloody Valentine if you're listening right now. And I, and, I, and I feel my favorite sequel is Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Because that's oh a sequel my God. that that's <laughs> no a sequel way. that does what no other sequel does. Wow! It's a great, it basically, great, great ends film. destroying the franchise, yet is still reborn. <laughs> yeah, that's Amazing. great. That's great. I'm I'm absolutely wrapped. You said that because I don't think I've ever heard anyone speak positively about Beneath the Planet. I love that film. And so, Beneath the Planet well, of the Apes so, is so insane. Yeah, it is I an love- insane movie. It is brilliant. I, uh, I love that movie too. Yeah, it's a bit contrived at points, but I mean... It's oh, God, so... yeah. Let me double lock the door yeah. so that they can get away. <laughs> it's just like, that's got to be like the worst thing ever. <laughs> hey, let me double lock the door. But the end with the mutants and that whole thing? Yeah. That's that's brilliant. No, I love that movie. And uh, it's definitely one that's on my list of uh, sequels suck that I'm going to talk about. But uh, yeah, I'm... I, Glad I, I've met someone now that uh, <laughs> likes it because I've even got Final. a book. I've even got a book that they brought out. I can't I just can't remember the uh, author's name off the top of my head, but it's a, a kind of a history on the Planet of the Apes franchise, and and it sort of talks about how negatively that movie was sort of seen in the eyes by a lot of people. So I was like, oh, well, I, I really liked that as a kid, and still like it, and. It's not yeah, perfect, any but... sequel that ends with that green is an insignificant planet is now dead. It's, <laughs> it's pretty brilliant <laughs> in my book, but you know, that's just me. Wow. Amazing. Cool. Amazing. Uh, this has been insanely great. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm very, very excited and, and very, very honored that you, you joined us. This is, uh, this oh, is well, it's Absolutely. my pleasure. Thank you, lads. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank nice you. Thank you so so much and uh we we can't wait i I cannot wait to see what this this 30 year dream project is yes Uh, well me too i'm 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 hoping it all happens the world is a strange place i'm 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 hoping i don't find myself forced into retirement yes (laughs) never never ever amazing Right. Uh, like Angus uh, said, it's been a privilege. And, and when I reached out to you and you said yes, that you wanted to talk, and you know, I was over the moon. And, and I really appreciate the time you've given us to just talk Scream 2 and, and movies in general. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. By definition alone, there are fewer films. Films, 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 films. Sequels suck.